On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we examine the video just released showing the condition of the bulk carrier Ruby Mar adrift in the Red Sea after being attacked by the Houthi back on 18 February. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So some really interesting video showing the condition of this bulk carrier, the first one that we have seen take severe damage by attacks from the Houthi. We're also going to discuss what the shipping company is talking about regarding salvage. Also comments from the U.S. Navy, from the Yemen government, and even from the Houthi themselves regarding the salvage of this vessel. We're also going to take a look at could this ship be responsible for some of the breakages we're hearing about in undersea cables. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So let's talk a little bit about Ruby Mar, what type of vessel this is, and its background. So this is a 564 foot, 172 meters for the rest of the world that's not the United States. Ship was built back in 1997, making her 27 years old. So a little bit on the old side for a vessel uh, flying the flag of Belize. She had been sailing from Ras Al Khan in Saudi Arabia, that's up in the Persian Gulf, and then heading to Varna in Bulgaria with a load of fertilizer, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Ship can carry up to 32,000 deadweight tons. You'll see she has five holes on the vessel. Now, the ship was struck on 18 February by up to two missiles, although I believe the missile in question that did the damage actually exploded along the ship's starboard side. We know that the vessel has dropped one anchor. You can see that the port anchor, though the anchor on the left side of the vessel, is still housed. However, the starboard anchor is straight up and down. The question is whether or not that anchor is holding. This is an extremely flat day that you're seeing and almost no wind, no current at this time. So one of the big issues that we're going to talk about here is the salvage of the ship. So some early images of the vessel caught by the BBC and posted on their website shows the vessel was riding higher than it is today. So obviously the ship is still taking water. Now the operating company for the vessel, Blue Fleet Group, told Sky News that they're working on salvaging the vessel right now. So unlike what you hear in a lot of movies and, and everything, it's not a matter of just going out, throwing a line on it and bringing it home and then getting salvage for it. You actually have to get a salvage contract. And no salvager is going to touch this vessel without a firm contract in place. Now, one of the things that is usually done when you're in a war zone is to have uh, military tugs available. And right now, the U.S. Navy is offering to assist in this. Unfortunately, the U.S. Navy is in poor condition when it comes to salvage vessels. It actually only has three salvage vessels in the fleet currently. They're building new ones down along the Gulf of Mexico, but they're not expected to come online for a few more years. So the closest U.S. Navy salvage vessel is USNS Catawba, which is up in the Persian Gulf. Other issue you have here is where do you tow it to? You have to bring it into someone's waters. And if this ship is carrying fertilizer and in danger of sinking, not many countries are going to want to take this vessel into their coastal waters. Now, they are working with the government of Yemen. Now, this is the government down in southern Yemen that the U.S. recognizes the government. It's down on the Gulf of Aden coast. This ship, Ruby Mar, is up on the... Uh, Red Sea coast. Plus, the vessel is leaking oil. Now, this is not heavy crude oil. This is diesel oil, but not the traditional diesel oil you get from pumps for your truck. This is a heavier type of marine oil. However, the Houthi have also come out regarding this. Uh, Muhammad Ali al Houthi, that if they want to tow the vessel, then they will allow the vessel to be towed, but only if relief aid is brought into Gaza. All right, let's go ahead and run this video and talk about what I see here. Now, for those of you who don't know, I am a former licensed merchant mariner. I sailed for seven years. I went to the State University of New York Maritime College up in New York. I hold an unlimited second mate's uh, license. So I know a little bit about this, not an expert by any means. So first thing to notice is, man, this stern is riding low. This ship is, is way down by the stern. So I had an opportunity from a news source to take a look at a video that was shot inside the interior of the vessel. I can't show it with you because I agreed not to. 
What the video showed was along the starboard side of the vessel, the vessel had been probably near miss. So the starboard side of the vessel would be this, this part of the vessel right here. Believed a missile hit right nearby. Didn't strike the vessel because what I saw was the plates, the hull plates, had buckled. The ship was taking a lot of water into the stern compartment. The stern compartment is an auxiliary machine space on this vessel. It's also where the shaft, the, the, the shaft of the propeller is. And water was coming in from multiple sides sites along multiple heights all the way down at shaft alley which is the very bottom of the vessel all the way up several uh, uh, several levels and so this ship was flooding in that level according to reports the ship was flooding not just in that after compartment but also the engine room and the very aft hold so pausing this here for a second this is hold number five right here. This is the main house. This is where the crew lives. Up here is the bridge. You'll notice the, both lifeboats are gone from the vessel. They had gotten underway. This image is also showing the, the deck. The main deck is a wash back aft. You'll get a great image of it in a minute here. If that missile exploded close aboard here, what it would have done is caused shock damage. And that shock damage is water is incompressible. And so that water pushes up against the vessel and bust in plates and accordingly the number five hold the engine room and the after machinery room are all flooding and this is a three hold vessel or a three a three compartment vessel so if you flood three compartments it's going to sink and it looks like that this ship is going to go down i actually don't think this ship is salvageable at all this is extremely flat calm weather here uh, when you put a tow on this the ship's going to become unstable to begin with once you start moving it let alone if the seas come up i, I think this ship is is heading down no matter what is done at this point i actually think salvage is, is very moot you can see some of the oil slick behind it that li that light slick that's going on just notice this real quick i mean you're seeing that the uh, crew compartments are starting the flood here so everything is flooding in at this point you're going to start seeing this ship take more and more water there's an interesting comment from CENTCOM. The Central Command noted in one of their briefs that this ship was carrying 41,000 tons of fertilizer. Now, there was a lot of debate about how much fertilizer the ship was carrying. Uh, I saw an initial statement saying it was barely carrying anything. But CENTCOM says it's carrying 41,000 tons, which is impressive because the ship's only rated to carry 32,000 tons. So I think somewhere somebody's got their numbers wrong on this. But let's assume the ship is really heavily loaded. So the way this ship stays afloat is by displacing water. So the forward five holds are full of fertilizer. So they're displacing water, but now you're taking water back aft. And what you're doing is putting a huge amount of strain on the aft end of this vessel, as you'll see. Uh, you'll notice those forward holds. You can see the bulbous bow sticking up out of the water up here forward. You can see the very light sheen of the slick this is coming out of the engine room so i'm going to hold this here for a second this is a really interesting image because you can see right here in the stern this is the after stern part it is underwater so i mean everything on the main deck is underwater plus i, I can't quite tell for sure but it looks like she's starting to sag even more here so if these forward four holes are full or even partially full and you start putting water in these after compartments, you're going to create a bending motion. And the fear you're going to have is this ship is going to break. And if it's going to break, it's going to be right here along this bulkhead between the number four and the number five hold. Uh, I am almost betting that's going to be what happens here. We're going to see that ship break apart right at that moment. But you can see how steep it is. Uh, it's going to be really hard to keep this ship afloat for any measurable time at all. And then you get this image. So the other thing that we notice, and I mentioned this in the beginning here, is when you come up forward here, you'll notice that the port anchor is sitting right here. So we do have the port anchor housed. The starboard anchor is straight up and down. Now, it, it's hard to tell whether or not that starboard anchor has fetched the bottom or not. This, the Red Sea is an extremely deep ditch uh, in many ways it's about a you know about 170 meters where i saw where this vessel uh, had been so this is really extremely deep we're talking about over 300 to 500 feet of water in different areas here now it gets shallower when you get ashore obviously as you get closer to shore but you would not be able to tell with this light breeze whether or not the ship's anchor had grabbed. Now, if it was a little more breezy, if there were a little bit more current, then you may see that anchor sitting out at an angle. That would tell you that the anchor is grabbing bottom. But from this image, it's hard to tell. And according to Sky News, the ship has drifted about 37 miles. 
So last image here, you get to the vessel, you get a good kind of view of it. Uh, again, this is amazingly calm in the Red Sea right here. I don't think this vessel stays afloat once the weather comes. So this is marine traffic, and this is showing the last position of Ruby Mar. Now, this is uh, an old position about eight days ago. If the ship has lost power, it's not transmitting, no batteries, it, it's not going to be shooting off its AIS. So you will not get a position of it. This is showing you that last position we have. Now, again, she's drifted beyond this position, so we're not exactly sure where she's at. She was heading northbound in the lane. You'll see there's a traffic separation scheme here. So this is Permanent Island. This is the Bob El Mandab. I don't have anything to drink. I apologize. I, I did not bring anything to drink with me, but I, I owe you guys a drink. Uh, she was heading north, heading up toward the Suez when she was struck. Now, she's adrift. She's dropped her anchor. Again, you see the depth here of water. It's extremely deep in this area that we're, we're in. And one of the things that you'll notice here is these kind of squiggly lines. Those are undersea cables. Now, they are not perfectly charted on a chart, but what it does show you that underwater cables are here that you should not anchor here. So depending on which way Ruby Mar has gone, she may have drifted across some of these cables. And if she has drifted across some of these cables, she can snag those cables with her anchor had a story where we talked about new new polar bear up in the baltic and that breakage of the uh, uh, gas line and the underwater cables between estonia and finland and one of the one of the cases could be that new new polar bear had let her anchor slip and that anchor had grabbed and severed cables ships do this all the time they sever cables constantly ships anchor ships drag anchor there was a, a very famous incident that took place off of long beach during the uh, uh, supply chain crisis where several container ships dragged and hit an oil pipeline so it is quite possible that ruby mar may be if there is a break in the cable that may be the reason why we're seeing breakages in the cable right now you would have to match up the cables with the position of ruby bar and i don't have that position but hopefully that's being done at a higher level than me but I, who knows at this point to tell you the truth so what we have is is ruby mar drift i i don't think she's going to be salvaged however the fact that this ship was hit and what makes this really unique is i think for the first time we have a major uh, warhead explosion on one of these weapons if you look at what the houthi have been doing up to this point we really haven't seen the warheads exploding at least not in the damage we've seen if you look at the bulk carriers that have hit there was a recent uh, attack on a ship called the islander that vessel got hit and punctured right through the top of the vessel and exploded uh, excuse me it didn't explode it actually went right into the interior of the vessel what we saw was basically fuel from the missile explode uh, so the graphia uh, one of those uh, bulk carriers that went up in the suez had that hole punched out of the side that was an example of that and probably the best example is marlin luanda that had its upper tank punctured had that huge massive fire on board but it was clear that the warhead never exploded this case it appears the warhead exploded because what we saw was multiple hull damage what you had was an explosion off the outside of the vessel on the starboard side and it buckled the plates, bent the plates, and you have water coming in. I do want to mention one other thing, which I think is really important because people will say this. Damage control on a commercial ship, it is not the same as a naval vessel. Understand the crew on board Ruby Mar is small. 24, 25 people on board. Uh, this ship would have been suffering multiple hits across. What the video I showed showed a hit at the very bottom, right where the shaft was, going up multiple levels. And understand, the lower the level is where the water's coming in, the more pressure that water is. And if you don't get those bottom holes plugged, then what's going to happen is the ship sinks, the pressure increases, and then the next one sinks. And, and once a hole goes below water, it's almost impossible to find the leak. And so this was well beyond the capabilities of the crew. This is why the crew abandoned ship. I don't think they were worried about the, the fertilizer exploding. We haven't seen what type of fertilizer this is. Yes, there's explosive fertilizer, but there's also pretty inert fertilizer. I think what they were more concerned about was the flooding they were seeing and the potential for that ship to go down. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come in. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon, and you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video or the next attack by the Houthi, which seems to be coming fast and rapid right now, this is Sal signing off.